This meeting is being recorded. Good evening, everybody. My name is Doug Mitchell, and I have the great honor of serving as the Executive Director of the Glacier National Park Conservancy. We're joined tonight by Dr. Elizabeth Flesh, who joins us from her home in Bozeman. Thank you, Elizabeth, for taking some time out today to be with us. I'm happy to be here. We're also joined by the best team in the business, uh, Grace Kinsler, Andrew Smith, Lacey Kowalski. Um, thanks, too, to a bunch of our board members who are on tonight. Uh, it really is a fantastic opportunity to learn about um, some incredible scientific research that has happened in the park uh, under Elizabeth's tutelage. Um, and we're just so honored at the Conservancy because of your support to be able to fund uh, this kind of, kind of game-changing uh, research that not only finds out interesting facts, but actionable facts can help the park change policies to help uh, basically uh, put our mission in place to preserve and protect Glacier National Park for future generations. Um, so, um, I, Elizabeth, uh, I wanted to ask you uh, about your path from uh, Betten, Bettendorf, Iowa, the home of the Fighting Bulldogs, to uh, Montana and this exciting research. How did that come about? Yeah, so I was born and raised in Iowa, and I was really fortunate that my parents brought me out to Yellowstone every summer growing up, and I really fell in love with the area as well as the area's wildlife, and I decided that I wanted to study wildlife biology at the university, and so I did my bachelor's degree at Montana State University, and I haven't left the state since. That's awesome. And that was 2012, I think was your bachelor's degree. And then you defended your dissertation in 2020? Correct. Yes. And then your work kind of within the confines of the park began around 2013? Yes. Yeah, so I worked with Jamie Belt and the Glacier Citizen Science Program from 2013 to 2015. Some people in the audience might know me from that. I coordinated the High Country Citizen Science Program that included pikas, mountain goats, and bighorn sheep. And so I really enjoyed spending some time in Glacier and helping with studies there during that time. And then I started graduate school in 2015. That's awesome. You know, the, the citizen science program is a really critical one. And we are very proud to have that as our Great Fish Community Challenge project of this year, where we are uh, working with the community to further expand citizen science, both in terms of diversity and type of opportunity. So it's really um, a great connection also. So I know you've got a presentation, so why don't you go ahead and share your screen and we'll get going. Okay. In the meantime, we will be giving away a couple of Fox shirts uh, today. Grace is sporting the uh, 2022 branded Glacier Park Fox shirt. Um, and I also wanna remind folks that the Glacier Book Club will be back in business next month with Wild River Pioneers um, by our great friend, John Fraley. Um, and that'll be in, um, uh, in September, so don't miss that. Um, so Elizabeth, without further ado, I will hand the, uh, uh, hand the chair over to you and uh, take us through. Great, well, welcome everyone. I'm excited today to discuss our recent research regarding bighorn sheep movement and genetics in Waterton Glacier. I'd like to extend a special thanks to the Glacier National Park Conservancy for funding this research as well as hosting this presentation today. We'll see if we can get my slide to advance here. Okay. So before we dive into the science, I wanted to go over how do you identify bighorn sheep? So if you're out hiking in Glacier, it can be easy to confuse bighorn sheep with other animals that you might see. So these are a few identifying features. You can see based on the individual in the picture on the right hand side that they have short brown fur, a white muzzle, in a white rump patch with a brown tail. This is a really nice distinguishing feature, especially if you're seeing some animals from far away. And finally, an interesting factoid is that bighorn sheep have split hooves that can help them with balancing on rocky terrain. So they can kind of use their hooves like clothespins to pinch the rocks and keep their balance. 
Now you might see male or female bighorn sheep and they look a little bit different. So male bighorn sheep have those classic really big horns. These horns grow throughout their lives. They are never shed like antlers. And as they get older, they get steadily larger. So you can see in this picture, there's an older ram on the right hand side and a younger one on the left hand side because his horns are a little bit smaller. Females also have horns that grow throughout their lives, but they remain relatively smaller in comparison to males. And they also have a smaller body size. And of course they have lambs and you might hear me use these terms throughout the talk. So we can call females ewes, males rams, and their young lambs. Now it can be a little bit more difficult to identify these guys in the wild when they're moving around. So I've got a couple of videos if I can get them to run a bighorn sheep where you can test your knowledge trying to identify if you're seeing male or female bighorn sheep. Now you can probably tell that the horns are relatively large on these individuals. And you can see even though bighorn sheep have brown fur, there can be a variety of different colors. So you can see that one individual in the back is slightly lighter than the other two. And you can also see that really nice distinguishing characteristic right there, the brown tail with the right rump. So you probably figured out that is a group of males it's helpful that typically you only see males together and females together. They usually only intermingle during the breeding season or rut, which I'll talk more about later. Now this video is a little bit more challenging. So let's see if you can try and determine what these individuals are. Their light brown fur camouflages really well against rocks as well as against the brown grass, but they're a little bit easier to see in the snow, which is nice. Now you've probably figured out that it looks like these individuals have shorter horns. So this is likely a group of ewes. However, you might have noticed there's one young ram hiding out in this group. You can see his horns are a little bit bigger. So when rams are between one and two years old, they will hang out in the group with their mom before they're ready to join the large ram groups. So you will sometimes see young rams mixed in with you. So that's something that's good to be aware of. Now it can be easy to confuse bighorn sheep with mountain goats, especially when they're really far away. And again, that brown tail is a really nice distinguishing characteristic because as you can see, mountain goats just have a white tail. Mountain goats have black horns that are more pointed than bighorn sheep, and they remain smaller than bighorn sheep horns. In general, mountain goats a lot of times appear more fluffy than bighorn sheep, but it can depend on the time of year. You can see this big horn sheep photo was taken in the spring where she's starting to shed her winter coat, whereas this mountain goat photo was taken in the fall where she has her thinner summer coat. Now this is a picture that I took in Mini Glacier in the spring, and so I'll give you a second to try and determine what these individuals in the photo are. Are these big horn sheep or mountain goats? Now you probably determined by now we've got a group of big horn sheep here in the back. You can tell by their lighter brown color. They look slightly less fluffy than those mountain goats. And we've got one more rebel big horn sheep over here hanging out with the mountain goats as well. And of course, these are not big horn sheep in the front. Those are our friends, the mountain goats. So hopefully these distinguishing characteristics can help you identify them in the field. Now I'm going to go over bighorn sheep life cycles. We'll start out in the springtime. So that's when lambing occurs, which means that the females give birth to their young. And we're going to talk more about that later in the talk as well. During the summer, this is when they're eating that really nice green vegetation and putting on fat for the winter. And sometimes they might migrate to a different area than 
that where they're located in the winter in order to obtain these resources. Just like we're able to go up to the high country more easily in the summer after the snow has melted out, they're able to do that as well. In the fall, which is November and December in bighorn sheep life cycle, this is when the breeding season occurs, which we also call rut. So this is when males are competing for females in order to mate with them, and then we're able to have lambs in the spring. And finally, in the winter, bighorn sheep just go into survival mode. They're mainly burning their fat that they acquired over the summer and just trying to get through until the spring uh, when they can access better forage. Now this slide provides an overview of the different topics I'm going to discuss during this talk. First, what we tried to do was identify lambing dates and areas for the bighorn sheep in Waterton Glacier. Next, we specifically identified different types of bighorn sheep movement, including their seasonal migration from winter to summer range, as well as what types of movement they were doing during the rut. Next, we related these movements to their genetics in order to identify what landscape features might be affecting their connectivity across the area. In order to address these questions, we had to use a data set composed of both spatial data and genetic data. In order to obtain the spatial data, we captured bighorn sheep using ground darting and put GPS collars on them. So similar to a GPS unit, or you might have accessed your GPS location using your cell phone, we can do this using a collar. Now these collars were programmed to stay on the sheep for about one year, recording their location about every five hours, and then they automatically dropped off of the individuals. We were able to collect those collars and then learn about their locations over the past year. Now we were also able to collect genetic data by collecting blood samples when we captured the individuals. Just like when you go to the hospital to do blood testing, we can safely obtain a blood sample and then use that information to evaluate their DNA. Now this slide summarizes the information that we were able to obtain. We captured about 100 individuals and obtained GPS collar data for them, as well as genetic data. And these data were about evenly split between males and females. So you can see a map of where these individuals were captured on the right hand side with pink points showing females and blue points showing males. So you can see it was relatively well distributed across the eastern side of Waterton Glacier. Now, in order to evaluate their genetics, we used a tool called the ovine array. And this was originally developed for domestic sheep, but is also informative for bighorn sheep. And it identifies single nucleotide polymorphisms in their DNA, which are also called SNPs. Now, this diagram shows you what a SNP is. As you probably know, the DNA is the code that makes us who we are. And of course, a lot of the base pairs represented by these letters here are similar between individuals because that's what makes them a bighorn sheep. However, there are individual variations and we call those SNPs. So you can see in a specific location in the DNA of these three individuals, the SNP varies. And so we compare these differences across individuals in order to determine how related they are. Okay, so now that you have that background information, I'm going to jump into our first topic regarding identifying lambing areas. So this was determined to be an important priority for the park for the aerial tourism plan. So they wanted to know when and where bighorn sheep are giving birth so that we can avoid bothering them with aerial tourism. Now we use the movement data in order to evaluate this question. And of course we expected them to give birth sometime in the spring. So if you look at the plot on the upper right, you can see dates ranging from May 1st to July 1st. 
And then on the left side of the plot, we're looking at how far an individual moved during that five hour time period between locations that that GPS collar recorded. Now for this particular individual, you can see that she's moving quite a bit throughout the spring. And the detection is based on the fact that we would expect a mother to move a lot less far when she has a baby. So that baby is not gonna be able to keep up with her as much as an adult you could. And so we would expect her movement to decline after giving birth. Now, if you look at the plot at the bottom, you can see that this use movement is very different. So she's moving quite a bit up until around May 15th. And then you can see that her movement drops off dramatically. And then she slowly is able to move a little bit more and then finally return to her former activity patterns. And so we would expect that the use activity to drop off about five days to three weeks following birth. And that's what we're seeing for this individual. And by using that data, we can actually identify to the date approximately when she gave birth to a lamb. And we were able to do this for 30 different females. So in this plot, we have the estimated lambing date at the bottom, and then the number of bighorn sheep that we observed this on the left-hand side. We also had data as to whether or not each ewe was observed with a lamb that season, and so we were able to compare that with the observed dates. So we had two outliers on either side in early May and late June that were likely false positives because a lamb was not observed with that ewe. But in the middle, you can see that we were able to identify the date for a lot of ewes that actually were observed with lambs. They had an average birth date of about May 29th, but it ranged from May 19th to June 13th. And we were also able to use this information to identify the important areas that these ewes were using for their lambing areas. So you can see their home ranges, which just means the area that they occupied for the three weeks following the estimated lambing date across Waterton and Glacier. And as I mentioned, this was really helpful for park management to protect these sensitive areas, uh, such as during the aerial tourism plan. So we know specifically what we need to protect to keep it nice and quiet for those mothers that are giving birth during the spring, both in terms of time and space. Okay, next I'm going to discuss our work looking at movement across the landscape, not just during the spring, but during other times of year. We were really interested to see if bighorn sheep in Waterton and Glacier are seasonally migratory, meaning that they occupy a different area in the winter than they do in the summer. And then we were also interested to evaluate their movement during the rut. And this is important because this is, of course, when gene flow occurs. So we can see some patterns in their genetics based on this. Now, this plot shows a diversity of migratory strategies that have been found in bighorn sheep. If you look at the bottom of the plot, you can see that their migration behaviors can range from residents, meaning that they just hang out in pretty much the same area year round, all the way to long distance strategies, meaning that they move a really long ways between their summer and winter ranges. Now this plot is showing these different strategies for herds found in Montana and Wyoming. And we were curious as to where Glacier's bighorn sheep fit into this. So what we did was we plotted the distance between where they were located on average in the winter and summer, as well as the elevational difference. And you can see that males are plotted as blue points and females as pink points. Now, in general, you can see that most animals move to higher elevations in the summer. And this makes sense because as the snow melts out, there's some really nice green vegetation that they can access that has really good nutrition. However, when we compared Glacier's bighorn sheep with the other herds that you saw in that previous plot, they tend to be mostly residents in comparison with some short distance migrants. 
And this is really interesting because Glacier is a native herd, meaning that it's never been extirpated or reintroduced. It's been there continuously through time. And it's similar to another native herd, Grand Teton National Park's bighorn sheep, where they tend to stay in the same area throughout the year as well. So in summary, we found that glacier individuals are generally considered residents in comparison to other bighorn sheep herds. But it is important to note that we were seeing differences in both elevation and distance throughout the year. And so other metrics to compare their migrations might be informative as well. Okay, now I'm going to discuss movement during the rut, which is November and December for bighorn sheep and how that affects the genetics of the next generation. So we were really interested to see how bighorn sheep move during this time period. As I mentioned at the beginning, this is the time period where rams are competing really intensively for access to females. So not only are they getting into conflicts, but they're also moving around a lot looking for opportunities and different groups of females to access for mating opportunities. So first we wanted to ask, how does movement during the rut differ between males and females? So you can see in this plot at the bottom, we plotted the total distance each individual moved during the rut, which was November and December. And then on the left side, we plotted how many bighorn sheep we observed this. So again, females are pink and males are blue. And you can see the male distribution of points is shifted right or towards greater distances in comparison to females. And this makes sense because they're trying to access those mating opportunities. On average, they moved about 75 kilometers in total during November and December, but we saw a maximum of 125 kilometers. So they're moving quite a lot. We were also curious how this differed by age. So we have age plotted at the bottom, ranging from one to 14 years old. And then again, the total distance that they moved during those two months on the left-hand side. Again, females are plotted in pink and males are in blue. And each number is just representing the number of individuals we were able to observe in that age category. So if we first look at the females, we can see that the line is relatively flat. Their movement strategy is not changing very much as they age. However, when we look at the male line, we can actually see quite a few differences between ages. If you look at that age range of one to two, you can see those males are actually moving similar distances to the females, because if you remember at the bit, beginning, they tend to hang out with their moms for a little bit before they're ready to be with the male group. But as they sexually mature, you can see that they immediately start moving quite a bit more during the rut. However, you can also see a drop off as they get much older. And this is because older males tend to be more dominant, more successful in mating. And so they can defend groups of females and don't need to wander around as much to find opportunities. So they tend to stay in one place more during the rut. Okay, so this led us to our next question, what environmental characteristics are associated with genetic connectivity? So we now know that males are mainly the source of gene flow in bighorn sheep, but what landscape characteristics might get in their way? We know they're moving a lot, but are they doing that in a circle? Are they going directionally? Uh, are there big lakes getting in the way? We were really curious as to how these individuals were interacting with the Waterton Glacier landscape in order to find breeding opportunities. So we had two hypotheses regarding this question. First, we thought that perhaps landscape attributes might facilitate or impede movement. Specifically, in this example, you can see there's a really big lake. So maybe that's really difficult for a big corn sheep to cross because they're not really swimmers and that might impede their movement in order to obtain rut opportunities. Alternatively, we might expect that bighorn sheep just hang out where there's good quality habitat. So we can compare that with different landscape attributes 
determine what's more important to their genetic connectivity. There are a couple of different conservation and management applications for this. If we can identify specific habitat characteristics that affect their connectivity, we can actually manage those characteristics to either facilitate movement or impede movement between groups of bighorn sheep, depending on the management goal. We can also inform how climate change might affect bighorn sheep in terms of their dispersal and gene flow between the population, since climate change is expected to affect the landscape. Now we first looked at the genetic data for our bighorn sheep to hypothesize what we might find. So if you look at the plot at the left hand side, you can see a lot of colored points. Each point represents a single bighorn sheep. Points that are closer together are more genetically related or more similar, and points that are further apart are less related. So we can compare that information with where the individuals were captured, which is shown in the map on the right-hand side. And the points are colored based on the general area where they were captured. So you can see there's a big gap between two clusters of points in the plot. And this represents St. Mary Lake. So we thought that perhaps this lake could be an important uh, source that might impede bighorn sheep movement throughout the landscape. Secondly, we also saw a gap that represented Waterton Lake between clusters of bighorn sheep. So this could also be an important source that could impede bighorn sheep movement. However, there is as evidence for dispersal, which means an individual moved between two subpopulations. So circled in the plot now, you can see there's a blue point that's kind of hanging out by itself. And this was a ram that was captured north of St. Mary, but was actually genetically related to all those individuals south of St. Mary. So he may have moved around that potential boundary. Similarly, we saw one purple point, which was a ram that was captured west of Waterton, but was actually genetically related to those individuals in North Glacier, like in many glaciers. So he may have also moved around that boundary. To address these hypotheses and research questions, we employed the following methods. So we first had to calculate the relatedness between pairs of bighorn sheep using their DNA. And then we defined the geographic area to evaluate connectivity using their movement data. First, to calculate relatedness, we looked at something that's called the kinship coefficient. And what this is, is it's a metric that compares two individuals and represents the probability that two random alleles, in our case SNPs, which we discussed at the beginning, are the same due to a common ancestor. And what this does is it represents relatedness in the past two to three generations. So I'm gonna demonstrate what this means with this simple pedigree. In this example, the U and the RAM bred in order to generate the lamb at the bottom. However, when we capture them in the wild, we have no idea who's related to whom, but we can determine this using their genetics. In this example, the U and the RAM are completely unrelated, and so they have a kinship coefficient of zero. However, the U and the LAM, of course, are highly related, and so they have a kinship coefficient of 0.25. Now we can calculate this for all individuals that we captured and then compare that information with where they were captured on the landscape. So then we can evaluate some of those landscape features such as water bodies or mountains that are between them to see if that affected those patterns of relatedness. Okay, next we wanted to define the geographic area to evaluate connectivity. And we did this by calculating the year-round home ranges for all individuals. 
So this means that we looked at the GPS points for all individuals all year round to determine generally where bighorn sheep inhabit within Waterton Glacier and merged all of those into one polygon. So you can see that represented by the blue polygon in the map on the right hand side. And you can see in general, bighorn sheep tend to inhabit the east side of Waterton Glacier as opposed to the west side. So it's very unlikely that you would observe a bighorn sheep when you're hiking on the west side in comparison to the east side uh, based on these results. Next, we wanted to determine if landscape attributes or habitat were associated with genetic relatedness, as I mentioned at the beginning of the section. Evaluate connectivity across those potential lake boundaries that we identified using the genetic data. And finally, predict future changes in genetic connectivity based on shifts in the landscape. Now, in order to address if landscape attributes or habitat were associated with genetic relatedness, we used what's called a machine learning optimization approach. And what this does is it identifies resistance layers with the best fit to explain the genetic data. So if you look at the plot on the right hand side, what we would do is look at a range of a landscape variables, such as a range of a different proportion of water covering a certain area, and then compare that with the amount of connectivity or genetic connectivity between the bighorn sheep on either side of that. And this explains gene flow both due to movement during the rut and permanent dispersal to another area, which we might have observed based on those points we saw in the genetic plot. Now we looked at a range of landscape variables that might explain genetic connectivity. So you've probably noticed when you've been out hiking in Glacier that some areas are easier to walk in than others. If there's a lot of elevation change, that requires a lot more effort. If the shrubbery is really dense, that can also slow you down. So we thought this might be the case for bighorn sheep as well. And so we identified a wide range of variables that could be used to try and explain their connectivity. In order to explain habitat, we used a model that integrates quite a few factors that we know to be important to bighorn sheep in regard to resources and their survival. For example, one of the factors that it integrated was the distance to known mineral licks, which is known to be important to bighorn sheep nutrition. Now to evaluate connectivity across those lake boundaries based on what we found in the resistance section, we use circuit theory. And you might recognize a picture of a circuit on the right-hand side from high school physics or college physics, but I'd like to explain it with something a little more understandable and fun. So you might recognize Pac-Man, and we can use Pac-Man to try and understand how we evaluated bighorn sheep connectivity across the landscape. So if you remember, Pac-Man has to navigate a complex landscape in order to find food, all the while avoiding the ghosts. There are particular barriers he must avoid, and there's a specific outer boundary that he cannot go across in order to do this. So if we replace Pac-Man with a ram bighorn sheep who's trying to find mating opportunities, if you remember, we defined that outer boundary using all of the home ranges for the bighorn sheep that we observed. And instead of trying to find food, of course, he's trying to find women. Now we're trying to identify what barriers might get in his way. And while he's doing this, he's trying to avoid being eaten by mountain lions. Now, if we zoom in to one particular area, we can look at this more closely. So we're trying to identify what barriers get in his way based on that optimization approach that I mentioned. So these might be hard barriers that he cannot cross at all. Or in the example of the trees, he may be able to cross it, but it may be a little bit more dangerous because those mountain lions are hiding in there. And so he may be less likely to cross it. Now we can represent this using different colors, ranging from low connectivity in cooler colors or dark blue 
to high connectivity with warmer colors or yellow and red. So those really hard barriers are represented in dark blue. However, as I said, he might be able to penetrate those trees, even if they're more difficult to navigate. So they're represented in a lighter blue. In areas where there's only some trees, that could be even easier, so that's represented in yellow. And finally, you can see there's a really clear path to that other U, and so that's an area with high connectivity represented in red. Now, if we remove all of those extra details, we can look at how this ranges across the landscape. So cooler areas represent areas of low connectivity, and those warm red areas represent high connectivity where that ram is likely to move in order to find use and successfully breed. Now we term an area where the flow is constrained as a pinch point. And these are really important areas for animals to move in order to connect different subpopulations. So that can be really helpful for management plans. Okay, so after we identify this, we could then predict changes in genetic connectivity based on shifts in the landscape. So I'm sure all of you are familiar with the fact that Glacier has an extensive history of forest fires, and some forest fires did occur between genetic sampling of our bighorn sheep, which occurred between 2000 and 2011, and our current evaluation. So this map on the right hand side is showing the perimeters of forest fires that occurred between 2015 and 2017. And so we can actually edit our landscape layer that represented canopy cover to show a reduction in that canopy cover based on wildfire. So you can see in that photo in the bottom left that was probably really dense with trees right before the fire. And now it's really open with lots of good vegetation for bighorn sheep. It's much more easy for them to spot mountain lions in that terrain. So they might be more comfortable navigating that terrain in order to find meeting opportunities. So if we return to our Pac-Man example, where the ram is trying to find ewes, if we set fire to those trees that were originally in his way, it might be really easy for him to get to that U now. And so we can predict that using this approach. And now I'm going to show you the actual results of this effort. So our top model to explain genetic connectivity of Waterton Glacier's bighorn sheep included both water bodies and canopy cover. So if you look at this plot, we have the proportion water found in a particular area, and then the amount of resistance to bighorn sheep connectivity on the left-hand side. So as the proportion water in a given area increased, it was much more difficult for a bighorn sheep to cross it. Similarly, for percent canopy cover, as we got into really dense areas of canopy cover up to 80%, it became much more difficult for bighorn sheep to cross those areas in order to promote gene flow. Now we're going to look at what this is on the map. So if you remember from our Pac-Man example, areas that are warmer are areas with lots of connectivity that are easier for rams to navigate, and areas that are cooler are much more difficult for them to navigate. So in this particular map, we're looking at our hypothesized boundary of the Waterton Lake and its associated drainage, which is shown with the black line. So you can see right around the lake, little connectivity is predicted, which makes sense, again, because bighorn sheep aren't very good swimmers. And at the bottom of the lake, we can see a pinch point, which is an area that's really important for a bighorn sheep to navigate if they want to access the subpopulation on the other side of the drainage. Now in the map on the right hand side, we're looking at our hypothesized boundary of the St. Mary Lake, which is shown by a black line along with its associated drainage. So again, you can see that the model predicted it's highly unlikely that a ram is going to go directly across the lake, but there's an important pinch point on the left side of the lake that bighorn sheep can use to access the other side. 
Now, we were curious to see how this might change based on recent forest fires. As I mentioned, there have been some major forest fires, which affected 11% of the study area defined as that big blue polygon you can see. So this might be important given that we saw canopy cover affected bighorn sheep connectivity. You can see it had a really big influence, especially in the Waterton side of things. Okay, so now this map on the right hand side is looking at the difference in connectivity after the fire with decreases shown in cooler colors, and increases shown in warmer brown colors. So after the fire, you can see there's a predicted decrease across that boundary. And this is because it was a lot easier for bighorn sheep to hang out on the Waterton side after the fire. And so the model predicted that they would just do that rather than cross the boundary to the other side. Now this map is showing the differences in the southern half of the study area or how things would change across the St. Mary boundary. And that's again represented by the black line. And you can see there's an overall increase in connectivity. And this is because the pinch point that bighorn sheep must navigate actually increased in area because as you can see on the left-hand side, there was a fire that burned right along the lake boundary. So that theoretically makes it easier for them to cross to the other side to access the other subpopulation. So in general, it's really interesting to see that wildfire is projected to influence bighorn sheep connectivity. But these effects were really context dependent. And this depended on the proportion of the area burned on either side of the boundary and the location of the burn in proximity to other factors that affected bighorn sheep connectivity. But it's important to note that the influences of fire may shift over time. Uh, fire may initially increase connectivity by making it really open and having really good forage. But as you probably know, if you've hiked through deadfall, later on as the trees fall down, it becomes really hard to climb over those down logs and the really dense new growth may actually decrease night connectivity. So uh, this effect could vary through time. In general, this work had a couple of different conservation implications. It's important to note that climate change could potentially influence bighorn sheep connectivity through increased wildfires, as well as alpine encroachment of trees if that occurs. And just back to the beginning of what we originally discussed regarding lambing areas, uh, we identified important areas for bighorn sheep during that lambing period that assisted in the park's aerial tourism plan. I'd like to end with a big thanks to all of our collaborators who were involved in this project. And again, a special thanks to the Glacier National Park Conservancy for funding this work and hosting this presentation today. So I hope this presentation gave you some more information for identifying bighorn sheep when you're out in Glacier. And hopefully now you know a little bit more about their movement and genetics. I'd be happy to answer questions as we have time. Thank you. Wow, Elizabeth, this is amazing. Um, what an incredible opportunity to uh, kind of see your brain in action. I, I, I made so many notes and, and uh, it's, re it's really remarkable um, to be able, I felt like I was kind of part of the research. So thank you for bringing us so close to this incredible work. I, I did um, message Mark Beal saying that I just know he's gonna steal the Pac-Man analogy. Um, cause that, that feels like a real Bealism to me. Um, so Lacey Kowalski, who's the, uh, my colleague and associate director for, uh, programs and policy here at the Glacier Conservancy has been monitoring the chat room. Uh, and there are a bunch of great questions, Lacey. There are so many great questions. Um, one of the ones from earlier in the presentation, Elizabeth was, um, has there been any interbreeding between goats and sheep? No, they're not closely related enough, so we don't have to worry about that. It is physically possible for bighorn sheep and domestic sheep to interbreed and produce offspring, but not for mountain goats and bighorn sheep. Okay. 
Um, one other question that was interesting to me too was, are there any collars that you find kind of high up on cliffs that are hard to retrieve? Occasionally that does occur. So whenever you capture big horn sheep, you kind of expect that there's a few collars you won't be able to retrieve because they're in too rugged of areas. But fortunately we were able to collect most of them in this case, but you do expect to lose a few because the sheep were being a little more difficult. <laughs> I'm going to skip around a little bit. I've been wanting to ask you this question too about um, the four young sheep that appeared up in the North Fork this spring up by Big Creek. Has there been any, any genetic sampling done on those sheep or any information that you have on those? That is a great question. So I have been in touch with the glacier biologist as well as the Montana Fish, Wildlife and Parks biologists about this and we're very interested in doing that. Uh, we hypothesize that they may have appeared there because of the recent burns in that area made a, may have made it look like a good spot for them to go. So uh, yeah, we're hoping to do that in the future and we have genetic information for Glacier as well as some other Montana herds uh, where they may have originated. And so we're hoping to identify that later. Okay, awesome, that's super interesting. Um, let's see, another question from Carl and Candy. Um, they are curious if at night the sheep lay in a defensive circle or at totally at random. We'll have to ask the sheep. <laughs> they do try and help each other, alerting uh, each other for predators. And you do tend to see them uh, laying and looking in different directions. But I, I can't say that for certain without getting in their minds exactly what they're doing, but uh, that's generally why they're a herd animal. They're trying to look out for predators and help each other with that. Makes sense. Let's see, Margaret had a question about any particular challenges of cross-boundary research or transboundary research. Insofar as looking across Canada and the United States or? Yeah, just if anything particularly challenging came up in that regard. Uh, no, it, we didn't really have any problems. Uh, we work closely with the biologists up in Waterton and keep them posted on our progress. So uh, mainly we avoid challenges by trying to be good communicators and involving everyone in the research and the big horn sheep don't really see a boundary. So it's really important to have those cross boundary collaborations. Yeah, such a strong partnership. Um, let's see, what else do we have? Let's, um, from Eric and Tanya, they were curious, did your genetic connectivity models control for the impact of humans, such as on the going to the sun corridor or the many, many glacier area? So we did not include that in our models for a couple of different reasons. Uh, one being that it's really hard to get good data on exactly where people are. And uh, these bighorn sheep data were collected between 2000 and 2011. So visitation patterns today might be very different than when the bighorn sheep were actually observed for the study. So that's one of the reasons we did not include that. Uh, we do discuss this in our paper that we wrote about this uh, regarding the fact that the going to the Sun Road does uh, go along St. Mary. And so it's possible that that could be adding to that boundary. However, I'm sure most of us who have been up to Logan Pass see bighorn sheep up there and they're crossing the road easily there. Uh, so it wasn't expected to be a huge influence on connectivity, given that we're observing that and it was hard to obtain good data to represent that. So that was not included in the study, but it's a really good question. Yeah, that makes sense. Let's see, one more that I'm seeing in here is about breeding season. And I think, yeah, from Eric and Tanya, they were curious if the dominant ram is the only breeding male similar to elk herds, or if there are multiple males breeding during the season. There are multiple males breeding. So other papers have found that about 55% of males are successful in producing progeny. So 
while the dominant male is distracted chasing someone else, a lot of times the younger males sneak in and try to get opportunities. And so those dominant males aren't quite as successful as they think they are. And it's spread across more males than you might expect, which is pretty interesting. Awesome, thank you. So Lacey, I'm gonna interrupt just for a second. And I know there might be, a, I think Doug might have a question a little further down, but we do have a couple of Fox t-shirt winners. So if you would send in unisex sizing, David Simmons and Sally Beer, uh, pop a little email to Grace and we'll send you a very stylish 2022 animal shirt. We do a different animal uh, print every year um, that we do in conjunction with uh, one of our partners, Wild Tribute. Um, and this year it's the, it's the Fox. Um, Lacey, while you're looking at that, Elizabeth, I am taken um, by both your intelligence and your youth. Um, this clearly isn't the end of your career. So my question is, what, what's next? What, what do we look forward to? What, what's net, what are you working on? Yeah, so I'm currently a postdoctoral researcher at Montana State University, and I work on wildlife genetics projects predominantly. And so, as you saw, I've been really happy to continue some bighorn sheep work after I did my PhD work on bighorn sheep genetics as well. And I'm currently working on a Mexican spotted owl genetics project, uh, which involves Zion and Capitol Reef National Parks. And then I'm also involved in a Weddell seal project that's uh, based down in Antarctica, and we're hoping to evaluate their genetics next year. So I'm busy with lots of different projects. Yeah, that's super cool. So talk to us a little more, if you think kind of a little more philosophically as you are involved in the scientific research field and particularly as we talked earlier in getting actionable science. Um, talk, to, talk to me a little bit about the balance between frustration and encouragement and, and promise and hope. And how does that all work for you as a, as a researcher? Because some days it must, seem really hard. We're looking at decline after decline. And, and then some days there must be those moments. How, how does that work for you? Something that really inspires me is that there are a lot of really passionate people who are involved in the natural resource field, both in Glacier and the National Park System, but also in state wildlife agencies that are working really hard to do their best for the resource and the wildlife that are out there. And so that really inspires me to be a part of that group, uh, trying to learn what we can and uh, make decisions about what we can that might help the species into the future. And so that's how I find hope uh, in this context. Well, we're, we're right there with you. I'm holding my, if you haven't seen it yet, the field guide with the cute little pike on the front. If you don't have one, um, Carl and Candy have an extra, but we've got a bunch in the office. If you want to stop by or give me a call. We have nine projects related to wildlife research next year, including really exciting one on golden eagle breeding, uh, which I think is exciting. And, and I just want to thank everybody because none of that happens because the conservancy exists. The conservancy only exists because you guys uh, give up your time, talent, and treasure in a way that allows us this year for the first time ever to say yes to over $3 million, $3 million in park projects for 2023, none of which would happen without private philanthropy. So thank you um, very much for that. That was supposed to be a short interruption, Lacey, but it got a little longer than expected. No, you're good. Yeah, we have one other good question from Doug Bonham. Um, he mentioned that Jamie Belt is seeing about a 40% decline in goat populations based on citizen science sightings. Um, and he's curious if you are getting or sensing a similar decline in sheep populations or if there's data to support that at all. So unfortunately, we don't have really good data regarding how many bighorn sheep are in Waterton and Glacier because they're really hard to see. That dark brown fur really blends in and uh, we don't have a systematic count that occurs each year. So when I was part of the Citizen Science Project, we tried to include bighorn sheep for a couple of years, but 
citizen scientists really weren't observing them with enough frequency for us to get a trend over time as uh, and with the mountain goat data, they actually have a much longer time series to be able to evaluate that. So unfortunately, right now, we just don't have the data to be able to analyze a population trend over time, but that's certainly of interest in the future. Any other questions for Elizabeth lingering out there? You know, I, I just think that it's, uh, you know, again, such a privilege to share time with each other, all these glacier lovers. It's so fun for me to see, you know, Gary Shea and, and uh, so many friends old and new. And this format in Zoom allows us to have Elizabeth in her home in Bozeman and me in the office in the hipster village of Columbia Falls. Um, so thank you to everybody for kind of, you know, being all in in this new way to communicate with each other because Doing this in Glacier on a Thursday night, there would be 12 of us. And instead, you know, there are 50 of us tonight who are in community with each other. Um, and I think that really matters. Elizabeth, uh, thank you so much for sharing your time. We are going to be watching with great interest all the, uh, all the great work that you do. Um, thanks you, Grace and Andrew and Lacey. And again, we have a number of board members on the phone. Mark Beal, thanks for your work. But Elizabeth, thanks so much for sharing time with us tonight. Thank you, it was my pleasure. Thanks everybody, have a great rest of your evening and um, we'll look forward to seeing you at Book Club and on the next Glacier Conversations. Take care and thanks for all your support.